<laughs> Praise God. Okay, we're going to begin. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would bless this time as we have this opportunity to hear from you and hear from your word. We pray that you would speak to us. We pray that you would cause our hearts and our minds to not be distracted and help us, Lord, to be blessed in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, today's title for the sermon is Discerning the Voice of Demons. So I know it's a very odd name for a sermon, right? It, it kind of is an odd name to have a sermon title, Discerning the Voice of Demons. Well, why, why is it important to know when demons are speaking to you? Um, we have to be able to discern several voices in life. So there's God's voice, there's our voice, there's the voice of even our sin nature, and there's the voice of demons. Today, we're going to deal primarily with knowing when something demonic is speaking and reasoning with our minds. So why, why does this apply to each person's life? Well, let's go to Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9, the back of the book, the very ending, but it's actually talking about the beginning in Revelation 12, 9. It's talking about the fall of Satan. It says... Would somebody like to read it loud? Anybody have it? Want to read it very loud? Okay, Tess, raise your hand first. You got to read it really loud since there's people on the hill today. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Amen. The great deceiver was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So we live in a world that we all know and experience and the Bible makes it clear that, that um, Satan is at work and those angels that followed him, demons are at work as well. So the first thing that you have to understand in dealing with anything demonic is that demons are persons. Persons. So they're not simply a force, not simply an automation, not simply uh, like gravity or electricity in that if you make certain choices, there's just an automatic response by force or nature. No, demons actually have personality, will, intelligence thought, strategy, perception, opinion, and desire. Therefore, they are persons. Very important to understand that when you're dealing with demonic spirits, you're dealing, in fact, with a person. The difference is that they don't have bodies in the way that we have bodies. Their main goal and purpose is to dominate individuals and to push them further towards destruction and away from God's purpose for their life. How do we know this? Let's go to Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians 6, 12. Who'd like to read it? Who today is going to read Ephesians 6, 12 for us? Shana, okay, read it really loud. Okay, key word there. What's the key word? War. War, wrestle. That's good. Wrestle. Who here has ever wrestled? What would you say is the purpose of wrestling against someone else? To win. To win, and how do you win? You overpower them. You overpower them? So, uh, what's another word for overpower? Dominate. You dominate. So, when you're in a wrestling match... The purpose isn't just to, uh, you know, get all sweaty and two people to walk away from each other. No, one will is going to dominate the other's will. So we know that based on Ephesians 6.12, it is Satan's and demonic spirits' actual goal, purpose, and will to dominate our will. Wrestling. Um, so the word actually... For wrestling there deals with because there's a lot of different Greek definitions um, but it has to do with even holding someone down with his hand on the neck so in ancient wrestling 
you know, in, in uh, modern times, it's more like you tap out. In ancient times, it was like if you get your hand on the person's neck and you're on top of them, like you win. So think of that. How, how much domination um, does that, that example kind of help us understand? You know, who here has ever had someone's hands on your neck? Or, you know, it's a very dominating position because in that moment, the person has power over you. Um, once, you know, once somebody gets someone into a chokehold or the hands on their neck, the fight is pretty much almost over. So we know that it is Satan's will to dominate. So in discerning the voices of demons, anything that comes to bring a level of domination over our life, we also see the word, what other words deal with domination in Ephesians 6.12? Somebody look at it and Speak it out as soon as you come up with the good educated rulers. Yeah. What do rulers do? Especially in ancient times, they dominate. So they didn't have democracy in um, ancient times. You didn't vote in somebody. and You didn't have rights. You didn't say, hey, you're violating my rights. No, the rulers had dominant power. And the other word there is authority. And that word authority actually has this idea of power and weight, like that there's weight or power to control. Notice, too, that it says, um, over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So there's rulers of this world. And the very word, even when it's talking about powers of this present darkness, the, the, when you look at the Greek, it's actually saying, powers of the world asserting independence from God or angelic or demonic powers controlling the sublunary world, which means the physical world. Evil always seeks to dominate. Love actually doesn't seek to dominate. That's the thing. Love is something entirely different. Love seeks, seeks to sublimate. Does anyone know what the word sublimate means? What? To, yeah, it means to elevate or to purify. The word sublimate as a verb means to make nobler or purer. So what love seeks to do is to sublimate and integrate. Everything that's of demonic nature seeks to dominate. Everything that's of God's nature seeks to bring to a nobler purpose or a more pure purpose and then integrate it. God, God is integrative. You know, once he purifies us, he brings us in. He doesn't push us away. So some of the first ways you can know if the voice that you're hearing in your mind is demonic is if it further leads you into more darkness and coming under a level of oppression by listening to it. God, when he reveals things to us, it can be weighty, but it's never going to be, and, and it can even be convicting, but, and even uncomfortable. It will even be uncomfortable when God puts things on our heart at times. But it's filled with light and is a process that leads somewhere really good. So when you listen to voices that are of demonic origin, it's always going to lead you into more darkness, more confusion, more fearfulness. And you'll feel like you're in a place of being dominated. So as thoughts come into your mind, if it's leading to you feeling dominated, feeling confused, feeling immersed in darkness... That's not God, and that's not even you. That's, that's a demon, and you have to be able to discern it. Even though God's voice can be very convicting, and no one, no one really, unless you have learned to love conviction, nobody naturally loves conviction. Nobody likes being told they're doing something wrong. But when God changes your heart, and God changes your perceptions of his correction, it leads to life. That's how you can know that the voice, it's the voice of God. When God's leading you to correction, you may not initially want to hear it, but it leads somewhere really good. The further you, you listen to a demonic voice, the further it leads into something really bad. Let's go to 2 Timothy 1 7. 2 Timothy 1 7. Who'd like to read 2 Timothy 1 7? Dylan, okay, read it loud for everybody to hear. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Amen. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 
Anytime we fear, it's not from God. It's not God at work in your reasoning or your thinking. You can know, if, if you're feeling um, bound by fear, you can know that you're being intruded upon by a demon. God never calls us to be fearful. Even the very word for the fear of the Lord, that, that word means reverence. Time and time again in the Old Testament, when it talks about reverencing the Lord or fearing the Lord, it's not talking about living in torment. So there's a difference in understanding the fear of the Lord, which is you know the beginning of all wisdom, reverence for God, understanding who he is, um, versus living in tormentuous fear that you cannot escape. So here's a thought to think. I don't know if anyone here has thought of this, but demons actually live in constant fear of their day of judgment. We know a couple of reasons why that's the truth, because when Jesus was in the, Bible, um, in the New Testament casting out demons, whenever they would appear before him, they were trembling and in fear, saying, are you, are you going to judge us soon? Are you here to judge us before the time? And so demonic spirits actually live in a level of constant fear because they're in total rebellion to God, so they know what's coming to them. You know, it's, it's kind of like the difference between um, a criminal who's ignorant and a criminal who knows that the entire U.S. government is trying to hunt them down. One, one may be like, oh, you know, I broke the law, but, you know, maybe I'll get away with it. If the other one realizes the entire power and weight of an entire country is coming after them. It's going to be a lot of fear. You're not you're not going to really be able to escape that. So in the same way, demonic spirits live with that kind of fear that they are never going to be able to escape God's judgment. Their, their choice has been done. So if, if you allow demonic spirits place in your life, you will experience the fear they live under. So how can you know if your mind is being approached by something demonic? If you're living in fear that is unrational fear, and if you're feeling constrained by fear, and you're feeling um, fear when God tells you to do certain things, realize, discern that that's not God. God's not okay with you feeling that fear, and he's not the one calling you to feel that fear. Let's go to James 2.19. Further, further evidence in the Bible for the reality of how demonic spirits actually feel towards God, it says in James 2.19, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder or tremble, depending upon the version that you have. So the reality of God to a demon is something very fearful. God doesn't want us living under that kind of fear. We know that for the Christian, God does not want us to be in torment. So when you have tormentuous thoughts, not of God. When you have things that are tormenting you, you can realize, you can say that's not of God. And the truth is, um, I would even say that it's not you. It's not you. Your mind isn't trying to torment itself. There are demonic spirits that try to bring torment, to drive us towards torment. And how do we know that this is the truth, that God doesn't want us to be living with torment? Let's go to 1 John 4.16. 4.16-18. Who would like to read it out loud for us? First John four sixteen through eighteen. Tony, read it really lo- really loud so everybody on the hill can hear. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So it's very important to understand when you have fearful thoughts approaching you, it's not God, it's it's not you, and it's not, truthfully, it's not even your sinful nature because your sinful nature's primary goal is... um, Gratification, not self-torment. Um, so you can realize that there are, in fact, demonic spirits speaking to your mind when fearful thoughts are coming. When you have fear of tomorrow, that's why Jesus, see, God gave us many commands. He said, fear not. He said, do not be afraid. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. So 
it is Satan's job, demonic spirits' job, to try to get us to worry, to try to get us to have anxiety. So very often the way that it works is thoughts will come to our mind that are not from us, outside of ourselves, from demonic spirits. And if you latch on and give place, if you bite into that thought, you actually fall into the temptation of giving something demonic place in your life. It is never God's will for us to have anxiety about the future. It is never God's will for us to have fear. Jesus didn't fear even though he knew that he was going to the cross. Jesus did never, never lived a day in fear. So God calls us to the same thing. So God and his so we know God has not given us a spirit of fear. So therefore, if anything of fear is approaching us, it's not of his spirit. God and his Holy Spirit also gives us power. For God has given us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So God's given us power. What has he given us power to do in this life? People share some things. When you think, what has God given you power to do? Live righteously. To heal others. To serve Him. Be His witness. What else? Overcome sin. What else? To obey Him. To glorify Him, to obey Him. To pray for Him and talk to Him at any time. To pray to Him, talk to Him at, at any time. So God has given us power. Power to live holy. Power to live free from sin. Power to live really in God's best will for our lives. Doesn't mean our best will. God's best will may not be for us to be, you know, super rich, super wealthy. God may say, hey, my best will for you is something different. But to live in God's best will for our lives. Anytime something tries to convince you otherwise, it's actually a demon speaking to you. If a criminal can convince a police officer that his or her gun is unloaded, that officer just entered into a really serious disadvantage in the situation. So in Christ, we have power. God has given us power. So anytime you hear things saying, um, you know, you don't have power to overcome, you're not going to be able to, to succeed at what God's called you to, or, you know, things aren't going to work out. It's a demon lying to you. Demons primarily lie to the believer saying that you don't have power to stop what they're doing or to change your state of mind from being um, one of letting yourself be oppressed to one of being more than a conqueror and overcomer. God has called us to be more than conquerors and more than overcomers. And the way that that primarily manifests in the life of the Christian begins in the mind. In the mind. God has called us to be victorious in our minds. Victorious in our minds. Love. God has given us not a spirit of fear, but power, love. So if anything tries to challenge the power of God, guess what? You're hearing a demonic voice. If anything tries to challenge the love of God, you're also hearing a demonic voice. Whenever you hear something telling you God doesn't love you, who here has ever heard that, that voice before? That God doesn't love you. Or even God, or how about this? God doesn't love me. Sometimes the voice can change into first person. That's really tricky. When you start hearing demonic spirits speaking to you in the first person, you're like, I'm pretty sure this isn't me thinking this. God doesn't love me? Why would I be thinking that? Or God's going to be done with you if you keep making mistakes. Or God hasn't forgiven you of that sin yet. Anyone ever have that one? God hasn't actually forgiven you of that sin yet. You're still in sin. Um, even though you're not, it's like, Five years, five years old sin and you've already repented for it and something's telling you God hasn't forgiven you of that. Well, guess what? You can know that that's a demon. You can know that that's a demon because as we saw in 1 John, perfect love casts out fear. So anything that attacks the love of God for the Christian, and I, I have to say for the Christian, because for the unbeliever, the devil will tell them the opposite thing. For the, those that are in rebellion to God, all of a sudden they'll be hearing voices saying, God loves you just the way you are. You don't need to change. Oh, yeah, that person's hearing a demon for sure. But for the Christian, when anyone hears something attacking the love of God for them, it's definitely of demonic origin. Now, the other issue is too, demons will try to make you think that you're not truly saved when you are saved. 
So there's this balance. Sometimes people will think, you know, all of a sudden they'll be thinking, am I really saved? Did I really give my life to Christ? Yeah, whatever's doing that is attacking your mind to try to sow doubt and to try to find place. That is demonic. But here's the really good news for those that are in Christ. 2 Timothy 2.13. Does anyone have this memorized? It would be a great passage to memorize. Anyone know it? You're, everyone's going to say, ah, or some people are going to say, I knew it. 2 Timothy 2.13. This is the promise for the Christian. What's it say? Somebody read. No, 2 Timothy 2.13. What's it say, Lucy? Read it loud. Amen. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Think of that. So even when our minds are mess, being messed with, God is faithful. Even if, even if we, in a, in a moment of time, are you saying, God, I, I don't know where my faith is gone. He remains faithful. And so what is the last thing that God has given us? Self-control. God has not given us a spirit of uh, fear, but of power, love, and self-control, sound mind. So sound mind, self-control go hand in hand. If you have self-control, you can control your mind. That's part of yourself. So the Lord has given us more self-control than we realize. It is also a fruit of the Holy Spirit, fruit of the Holy Spirit, to have self-control. So anything attempts, that attempts to reason with you to say that you don't have power to do what God has clearly called you to do is a lie. When God says, I'm calling you to do this, you actually have the ability to do so. Self-control. God has given us self-control. God's spirit empowers the Christian to operate in self-control. Not to be like someone adrift at, at the, you know, in the middle of the sea when it comes to choices and decisions. So any time something is trying to reason with you that it's okay to feel adrift at sea, you know, uh, does everyone understand what I mean by that? Like where you kind of are jumping between this and that and that and no direction, no, no real anchor. Whatever is speaking to you saying that that's okay to live like that, it's not of God. God didn't, God didn't give us this Christian life to live adrift at sea. He gave us power, love, and sound mind, self-control. So this is going to be really simple. So I'm not going to use a lot of passages for this point. But the most clearly definable way you know that you're hearing a demon is if you're being tempted to sin. So I had to throw that one in there, even though it's obvious. We all, we all know that one. But if you are being tempted to sin... Um, Here's the thing to understand. Your sin nature is prone towards sin, but there's a difference between an outside force tempting you to sin. So when the temptation comes, yeah, your sin nature is prone towards sinning. But there's also the reality that something is coming and maybe providing opportunity for you to sin. And it's willful, it's strategic, and it's intelligent. Yeah. If you look and examine your lives, many of the times where you've fallen into great temptation, um, you may have been in a place where you were ready and willing to accept the temptation, but there is also something setting it up for you to fall. Really for the lust of your eyes or the lust of your flesh or some, some kind of pride to be put right in front of you at the right time, knowing because you were a sinner that you would choose it. It's important to view life through this type of paradigm to understand the interworkings of this warfare that we're in, how demonic spirits operate, and how they affect our mind and what their voices sound like. So, yes, your sin nature is prone to sin, but there's very often an active force of temptation coming from outside of yourself. We see that in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't Adam and Eve that one day just said, forget you, God, we want to we wanna rebel. There was something that came from outside of themselves and tempted them in a very crafty way to get them to un to forsake and forgo the principles that God had already told them. Do not eat of the fruit. Well, we also see that in the temptation of Jesus Christ. We see that God had a purpose in Jesus fasting for 40 days. And Jesus didn't start saying, oh boy, I'm so hungry. I should turn the, the stone into, into bread. And he didn't say, oh, you know, I really... I don't know if they're going to really appreciate my ministry. Maybe I should throw myself down. Or, oh, 
Maybe if I gave myself to Satan, the ruler of this world, he would be willing to give me everything. No, it came from outside of himself. That's the nature of temptation. We also see that in Peter rebuking Jesus. When Peter rebuked Jesus, Jesus rebu rebuked Satan. He didn't rebuke Peter. He didn't say, Peter, buddy, like you're just not thinking right. He rebuked the spirit. In that moment where Peter rebuked Jesus, that wasn't, that, that wasn't just uh, Peter coming up with a, a great idea. He was actually speaking forth what Satan wanted. We see that even in Judas betraying Jesus. Does everyone know what it says? It says that um, right, right in the Last Supper, it says, and Satan entered him. So though Judas was prone towards betrayal and being a sinner, he had help. So therefore, anytime you're being faced with a temptation, know this, that there is a demon present seeking to lure you into disobedience outside of yourself. How else can, can you know, or how else can I know if, if you're hearing a demonic voice? Or is the voice coming from someone that has been in fellowship with demons through their involvement in willful disobedience to God? Let's go to Acts 16, 16. Acts 16, 16 through 18. Because here's the truth. If you're, while you're going there, listen. When someone is in willful disobedience to God, they are actually in fellowship with demons. That means that they can very often be the very mouthpiece of a demonic spirit to speak into your life. When somebody is in willful disobedience, they are in fellowship with demons. So how can you know? Well, gosh, if you know somebody is in willful disobedience to God, if they're involved in witchcraft or if they're involved in some kind of clearly definable sin that the Bible says is damnable, then guess what? A lot of what they're going to say through their mouth is not even them. It's through the things they are in fellowship with, with the spirits they are in fellowship with. Acts 16, 16 through 18. Who'd like to read it out loud? Isaiah, read it really loud so everybody can hear. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel proposed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. Oh, sorry. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Amen. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having been, become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So here's the thing. This woman was under a spirit of divination. What was coming through her? was not of God. It was of demonic origin. So I want to open it up for what was wrong with what she was saying? Anyone want to throw out some ideas? I mean, she's saying these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Any, anyone? Oh, some are first. And then. Causing a scene interrupting what they were doing. What else? What else? Any? Drawing attention to herself. Drawing attention to herself. What else? It might have been like mocking. Mocking. And it would validate her and her profession. Yeah, it would validate her that, oh, this person, she's the knower. She, she's, you know, yeah, like she's given them her stamp of approval. So that means that, you know, she, she really knows that these guys are, are the real deal. And so I'm above them, but you should listen to them. So here's the thing. Um, yeah, you know, there was probably a level where it was mocking, but notice this. God sent them to, to minister, and the voice that was coming was getting in the way. So you can know if God has called you to do something, whatever voice comes in that tries to deflect you or tries to take your attention off of what God has told you to do, it is of demonic nature, it is of demonic origin. It is important to discern that. If God tells you do this, and all of a sudden you start hearing some new ideas of what you should try to do instead of that, guess what? You're hearing a demon. 
So this woman was the mouthpiece of demons. It was mocking, and it was an attempt to circumvent God by her getting the glory because she had a reputation for being a fortune teller. So everyone listening would have seen that she was operating in her authority. We see several principles. One, demonic spirits mock the truth. So anytime, anytime you hear something mocking the truth in your mind or truth where God has made it clear to you this is true and something is mocking that truth, discern it, it is a demon. Demonic spirits are, here's, here's a really intense one. Demonic spirits are not afraid of the words of truth, but the authority of the truth. I mean, she's literally speaking truth. The demons have a vested interest in her saying this truth for some reason in this instance. Therefore, the truth can be used against you. The truth can be used at times by demonic spirits, but they can't ever operate in the authority of God. So, for example, while she's saying this, she's not operating in the authority of the truth. She's just speaking the same words that the truth is. Um, let's go to Acts 8, 7. And we're going to go to, in a little bit, unpack that a little more. But Acts 8, 7. Acts 8, 7, it says... For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. The point here, any time, who here has ever felt like unclean thoughts are approaching their mind? I mean, everybody, yeah. Anybody over the age of five is going to feel like unclean thoughts. Maybe there's this like period where God kind of protects, you know, like the most unclean thought like a three-year-old has is maybe thinking they're not going to be able to play and they're sad about that. But, um, you know, in adulthood, whenever unclean thoughts are approaching your mind and you are not actively going after something unclean. So, you know, for example, if somebody is going and searching for pornography, well, yeah, they're, they're going into it. So that may not necessarily be a demon that's bringing the unclean thoughts. That may be rising from their sinfulness. But if you're trying to live pure and holy and unclean thoughts are coming to your mind, guess what? That is a demonic spirit. In the Bible, the word unclean, um, in the New Testament specifically, very often is used to describe demons. That whenever something comes and tries to make you feel unclean or to put unclean thoughts in your mind, not of God, you need to discern that it is in fact a demon. Let's go to Luke 11, verse 17 through 23 verse 17 through 23 but he knowing their thoughts said to them every kingdom divided its against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls and if satan also is divided against himself how will his kingdom stand for you say that i cast out demons by beelzebul and if i cast out demons by beelzebul by whom do your sons cast them out Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons and the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own place, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There are two main principles that apply to this sermon. Because this passage could deal with many things. It could deal with casting out demons. But in terms of discerning spirits and discerning the voices that are operating in your life, the thing to understand is that Satan's kingdom is not divided, which means that there is great level of strategy. So, for example, whenever military operations do things, there is great coordination, especially in our day and age. But even in ancient times, there was never... Any military operation that wasn't coordinated, guess what? They lost. You know, they lost. Everything about the Romans, the way that they conquered the world, they had exact military coordination, different strategies. As soon as, and, and even in history, there's all of these different strategies. Most of us aren't familiar with uh, military history. Usually the only people that are familiar with that are like historian junkies 
and, you know, history buffs and people that are actually studying military. But there's all of these different strategies like, um, you know, you go on attack and then retreat and you have an ambush there. You um, can do different things and, um, you know, you split your army apart and surround the other side, you know, one massive army and you attack from both sides. The thing to understand is that when in your life you're starting to be surrounded by different things or different thoughts, um, it is in fact coordinated. So for example, when somebody starts feeling approached by depression, guess, guess when, uh, when lust starts coming or lustful starts co start coming, it's not two separate things. It's actually coordinated. Satan's kingdom is not divided. Satan's kingdom is not divided. And this is something to understand. That's why very often when you take strides forward to, towards the Lord, all of a sudden, you know, you get bombarded with this area and then this area. And then all of a sudden these thoughts are coming. And right as these thoughts are coming, suddenly you're having past thoughts about who you used to be. And because who you used to be was this horrible, rotten sinner, now you don't feel loved by God. And then, you you know, the next bad thing happens. And if you're somebody prone towards anger, you feel anger. And if you're somebody, poor, you know, prone towards depression, you feel depression, it's, it's strategic. So the, the thing to understand there, Satan's kingdom is not divided. He, he is strategic. Demonic spirits are strategic. And the thing to understand too, it, in terms of discerning um, voices of demonic spirits for, in, pertaining to this sermon, Notice it says, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusts and divides his spoil. There's many different interpretations, but the primary interpretation of that is that demonic spirits are strong and it takes force to overcome. So the word cast out in the Bible means it actually always entails when it deals with demons some level of violence. So in overcoming demonic thoughts, when you discern them to be not of God, you can't just sit there and be like, okay, like, go away thoughts. You have to, something has to rise up in you. Just like if you were in a fight, something rises up in you and you don't just sit down and get a beating. You, you push the thoughts away and you, it's okay to do it violently. The, the very word Jesus, <laughs> Though Jesus maybe didn't have to yell and scream and get all up into a big, you know, huff to cast out demons, it was very violent. I mean, he, he spoke, it happened, and the demons had to leave. And it was a, it was a instance of God's force and power overcoming the darkness. So as, God, as we all deal with hearing demonic voices, maybe at different times in our life, something has to rise up and push back. Let's go to um, verse 24. It's still in Luke. When the, unclean, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest and finding none. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So, as I said, this is a very complex passage with many different things we can discuss. But we can know, here's, here's the other thing, that it's important in order to understand and to discern demonic voices in your life. Demonic spirits are possessive. Possessive. So, if you're experiencing freedom in your life and out of nowhere, at a later time, you begin to feel something encroaching attempting you to bring you back under a particular sin or maybe errant way of thinking, a wrong way of thinking, or some kind of bondage in your life, you can know that it's from demonic origin. So God, God is stronger, and if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we can overcome Satan's attempts to pull us backwards into sin. But do understand this, demonic spirits are possessive anytime a spirit has had any place in your life. So that means all of us, because we've all once upon a time been under the prince of the power of the air and un children of disobedience, not part of, we weren't born into God's kingdom, but born into Satan's kingdom. Demonic spirits are very possessive. They'll try to mess with you if they can. They will try to pull you back into sin. That's why 
people, we were just talking to, uh, you know, somebody the other day actually ministering at the park here on Friday. And he was saying like all these people that he knew going to church, they would like, oh, I'm all about Jesus. And then get pulled back to drugs like a couple months later. Then they'd be back at church. I'm all about Jesus. And they get pulled back into drugs a couple months later. It's because demonic spirits, you may say no, but that they may say, well, how about yes? They may come back and try to convince you at a later time to let them in. Now, that's nothing that anyone needs to fear about. But the thing to understand is to discern properly. To discern. Because, hey, if you know that the voice you're hearing is something uh, that you were once in slavery to and bonded to, you're going to be a lot more likely to push it away initially than if you think, hmm, like this is interesting that I'm thinking these things. I thought I was living for the Lord. No, you must discern that it's of Satan. It is a demonic spirit speaking. Let's go to Mark 3, 11. Mark... 3 11 mark 3 11 who'd like to read it mark 3 11 dylan read aloud and whenever the unclean spirits saw him they fell down before him and cried out you are the son of god and he strictly ordered them not to make him known kind of jump ahead no, that's great. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. To the extent that we have Jesus operating in us and through us in our life, we have authority, authority over demonic spirits. But this can be sometimes a real kind of like gut check, a reality check. If, if you are constantly being bombarded or dealing with difficulty with demonic things in your life, it can be that you need more of Jesus in your life or more surrender to him in your life. Because whenever the demons would encounter him, they'd fall before him and they'd acknowledge that they were powerless. So the best way to overcome demonic spirits in a person's life is to be full of the presence of God and because the presence of God is the same as being full of the person of God, be full of the Holy Spirit. Be full of the very person of God. Let's go to Luke 8, 26. Luke 8, 26 through 33. Or excuse me, 8, 26 through 39. 8, 36. 8, thank you. 8, 26 through 39. Okay, they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert jesus then asked him what is your name and he said <clears throat> legion for many demons had entered him and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and they begged him to let him enter these so he gave them permission then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. There are a couple principles here in dealing with discernment. One that may not be that obvious is that the man, they had tried, other people, and maybe even himself, had tried everything in the natural to overcome the demonic spirits. They chained him, put him in shackles, kept him under garden and down there, who knows if this guy at times had some sanity every now and then, and we don't know. But he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So he could not, he could not overcome um, the demonic in his own power. So in the same way, for the Christian, we are reliant entirely upon the power of God and the power of Jesus Christ. 
And the ways that the world tries to deal with different things don't bring real freedom. The way the world tries to deal with uh, freedom from addiction, just it's like a shell game. Like instead of addiction to alcohol, well, let's make you an addict to working out. Or, okay, you don't want to be addicted to weed. Well, let's make you addicted to money now. God breaks addictions in people's lives. The power of God breaks addictions. And the way that the world tries to deal with the demonic is powerless. So in discerning... <clears throat> <clears throat> In discerning demonic voices in your life, you may at times try in your own power to do something. Who here has ever felt oppressed by something and then turned on the TV to try to escape it? Who here has ever um, felt, you know, like things were messing with your mind and you said, okay, well, I just got to reach out to a friend and maybe even somebody that's not a good friend, um, somebody that maybe themselves is part of the problem in your life. You know, who here has ever gone through feeling like things, demonic things were messing with your mind? And maybe even at the time you didn't know it was demonic. Maybe this was before Christ. And you try to come up with some kind of solution or answer to solve your problem. Well, we see here the way that demons are dealt with is through the power of God. We see a couple principles here as well that demonic spirits main motive of operation is to afflict human human life they they knew that if it was either that or judgment and they were so so needing or they're so determined to um have to bring affliction that they needed they 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 said jesus will you give us a different host and he sent them into the pigs as you're dealing with demonic things in your life, you have to realize what the stakes are. You're not dealing with an enemy that is like a human that has capacity for mercy. Because even, even a wicked person actually can have some capacity for mercy. I don't mean the most wicked of the wicked, but there's many bad people in this world that uh, their humanity is and the image of God has not been totally, utterly destroyed. Demonic spirits have none of that. No grace, no mercy, no goodness. Um, all they want to do is bring torment. So, what verse did I go to before? Was it 33? 33, 34. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it to the city and in the country. Then the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Again, we see a couple principles in this that... It is God's will for us to be having a sound mind or to be in a right mind. Hence, anything that tries to attack that, anything that tries to put you in a place of depression, anxiety, confusion, schizophrenia, um, double-mindedness, all of that is of demonic origin. Because after this guy is set free, he has none of that. The crazy has gone. So whenever... Cra and we all can deal with some crazy thoughts at times and have to deal with different. The crazy is not from God. It's, it's anything of lunacy, craziness, or not being able to perceive reality properly. It's through, from a demonic veil or demonic thought. So discern it, discern it, discern it, and discern it some more. Let's go to Matthew 10, 1. Now, here's the thing. In understanding and discerning voices of demons in your life, someone might say, oh, that's kind of scary, and what am I going to do? Yeah, it could be a little scary, but this is the good news. Matthew 10, 1. And he called to him, this is Jesus, his 12 disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So what God does is he gives us power, authority, to literally cast out, cast away, push away 
demonic spirits. But you must exercise it. So every Christian, whenever, when your mind, when you discern that your mind is being approached by demonic things or demonic thoughts, you have the authority to cast those things away. It says in 2 Corinthians that the weapons of our warfare are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. Tearing down of strongholds. And how do those strong and to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? So when we do that, when we do that, we actually are able to have victory and freedom. Let's go to Mark 9, 29. What else has God given us the ability to, to do? And this is another thing that we must discern. Mark 9, 29. Would somebody like to read it? Mark 9, 29. Who's going to read? Mark 9, 29. Don't go for it, Tony. Um, what's that? A lot of people here aren't uh, too big into sugar. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thanks, so. Uh -huh. Some, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Amen. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything, uh, driven out by anything but prayer. So here's what you need to do. When you discern that your life is being touched by something demonic, you must pray. You must pray. Realize it. Realize it and pray. So prayer is the weapon God has given us. So if something is hindering you from praying, guess what? Something demonic is at work in your life. Because who here, um, who here can watch, you know, and maybe has seen times in their life where you're able to stay up watching movies, and then, but you can't stay up and pray, right? You can, you can maybe watch, uh, you know, a two-hour YouTube thing, but you can't pray without your mind going crazy for like 15 minutes. That, I, even if there's one thing that Satan attacks, it's the prayer life of a Christian. So prayer, you must discern. You must discern if something is trying to keep you from praying, guess what? And gosh, I can't even tell you how many times I even feel like when sometimes when I try to pray, um, suddenly it's like pressure, less pressure to, to get done other things will, um, to get done things that are important. Well, you know, I'll feel like less pressure, like, oh, I should really try to get this done. Well, no, the answer is prayer to pray. When God calls you to pray, you must pray. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4.1. 1 Timothy 4.1. I will feel less pressure to get things done. Or I'll feel more ability to get things more done. Freedom. More freedom. <laughs> so I'll feel less pressure like on my back. Like, oh, I could go do this right now. I can get this done. Where maybe before that, it's like before praying, all of a sudden there's resistance. Like, oh, I can't do that. I don't, you know, there's too much. Everyone here, you know what I'm talking about, Shana. Like you, God tells you to pray, and then suddenly you're like, oh, I feel a burn on to, to do the thing that I should have done an hour ago. Amen. <laughs> That's, it happens. In other words, anything but prayer is okay with the devil. Yeah, even a good thing. It's kind of, it can be like God calls you to pray, and that's like the, you know, like the real, the, that's the gold, and the devil's like, okay, well, I have to give, I have him, to give him the silver. <laughs> So he doesn't get the gold. Yeah. First Timothy 4 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. This reveals something. So sometimes the word is doctrines of demons. I'm going to try to expand expound on this, even though um, it's not implicitly totally there. Anytime you have a teaching or a doctrine, it means that it is well thought. So, for example, um, when you go to school, you know, and you're learning a particular field or, you know, in theology, a particular doctrine, it means that there has been a lot of time, effort, and energy put into thinking it through. So, hence, a doctrine or a teaching of demon 
is not something that the devil's coming up with on the spot, and it's not something that is very, um, I guess you could say, airy and um, holes in it. The devil's greatest tools are very well thought out arguments to the mind. So it's important to understand sometimes, sometimes the argumentation that goes on in our minds, it seems like it's so reasonable, can actually be founded in a doctrine of a demon. So though that's talking about, you know, doctrines of demons entering the church, anything, anything, any strategy of the devil to bring deception or error into our life is in fact the doctrine of, of a demon. You know, it's, it's totally different than, I guess you could say, the momentary temptation where, you know, like just in the moment something comes to tempt you. It's a well thought out plan or strategy with all the different components of a well thought out plan to try to get you to stumble and fall. We mu that is why we must discern. That's why there, there are so often so many um, components to the lies that we believe that it's not just very simple. It can very oftentimes be as complex as a doctrine. You know, for example, the word justification. Like people have written no just countless novels, countless volumes on that one theme of justification. Just justification. But when we think about it, we think like a little sentence or blurb in our mind. But when you dive into some of the lies that the devil tells us, you can see like, oh, this is a lot more complex than I thought. And so it's very important to discern because the moment you come into agreement with a lie or a doctrine of demons, you're not just coming in touch with something very small. You're coming in touch with volumes of well-thought lies and strategies to try to trap you in, in that. So you must be able to discern Matthew 12, 22, it says, Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. Now, how else do we need to discern demonic voices in our life? There is actually a principle here. In the New Testament, there were many, many times where people were healed of blindness and muteness or deafness when a spirit would be cast out of them. Now, there are spiritual realities that at times can be reflected in the natural. When you have something trying to get you to be blind to what God has showed you or mute when God has told you to speak, you're dealing with something demonic. When God tells you to speak, you, you got to speak. And if you don't speak, there is a demonic spirit trying to mute your voice, trying to make it so that you can't, can't talk. Or when God shows you something and you're like, wow, I saw it so clearly. And suddenly it's like, boom, you know, a veil over your eyes. That is a spirit trying to keep you from seeing what God just showed you. There have been times where, um, where I had to write things down. You know, maybe God speaks something to your heart and it's like, you got to write it down because something may actually snatch snatch it from you so it's weird how it can happen like one minute you're feeling like god just showed you something incredible and then the next minute you're like what did i what was that well yeah demonic spirits can try to blind us in the moment there where god shows us something very important you know in fact god, that's why god has given us his word has given us the bible so that things can't uh come and and challenge god's revelation you know, it, God's revelation, because it's written down, cannot be challenged and cannot be changed. Um, I mean, people can try to change it. People can try to challenge it. But what I mean is imagine, you know, this is like the difference between um, really all of the religions and, and Christianity, Judaism, that, you know, all these other religions base their revelation of God, quote unquote God, off of one guy's personal experience and telling other people about it. It's not very reliable. And then generations go by where it's like, oh, this guy told, said this and said this and said this. Well, codifying things is very powerful. So even in your life as a Christian, when God speaks something to your heart, you know, it can be very important to write it down. If God reveals something to you, write it down. It's a little side tangent. 1 Corinthians 10.20. We're almost completed. 1 Corinthians 10.20. So how can you also know if something demonic is approaching your mind? 
I'm going to, this is going to be an interesting idea, but in the Bible, New Testament and Old, there are several times where it mentions that um, people are offering sacrifices to demons and not to God. So 1 Corinthians 10.20, no, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. It's always some kind of sacrifice that demons try to require of a person. So even believing a lie actually can lead to some form of sacrifice. For example, the person that, um, that goes to alcohol for years of their life, it's almost like... It, their life has been offered up as a sacrifice, a wasted time. It's like a sacrifice unto these demons. Or if we go back into the Old Testament, Psalm 106, 37, it talks about um, the people that sacrificed their sons and their daughters to, de to demons. Instead of them being able to have their firstborn son, which, you know, think of the blessing that God intended that to be, or their firstborn daughter, they sacrifice to a demon and they actually are robbed. So anytime... <clears throat> demonic spirits are at work, they'll tempt you to sacrifice something and in actuality, you're taking a greater loss than you could ever imagine. So how does that work for the believer today? Demonic spirits will tempt you to sacrifice your peace. And yes, you can actually sacrifice your peace. And when you sacrifice your peace, you are particip you're making sacrifice to a demon. Um, when you sacrifice um, your understanding of God's love for you, I, we don't, I, I don't know why we do it at times, right? No one, when, we, when we're thinking clearly, we don't understand why we're, we're so willing to sacrifice the good things God has given us. But whenever the devil is trying to take away the good things God has given us, you know, it happens to remind, we actually can participate in sacrificing that which God intended to be a blessing, and then we end up with nothing. We can see it very often when we're not in the middle of it. But, you know, for example... Anger can even be that. Sometimes people can get angry in the moment. And it's like, well, they're sacrificing their peace or another person's feelings. Well, all of that has a demonic tint to it, and it needs to be discerned. Acts 19, 13 through 16, and we are very close, just two more verses, and, and then we're completed. Acts 19, 13 through 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overcame them, or overpowered them. Um, so... The thing to understand is the devil's not so much scared of the name of Jesus just as a name, but he's scared of those that understand and have embraced the reality of who Jesus Christ is. They tried to cast out demons in the name of Jesus and it didn't work because they didn't believe in the very name that they were challenging the demons with. So. In discerning demonic voices in our life, we must, one, believe that there's power in the name of Jesus. Two, believe that that power is greater than what the demonic approaches our minds with. And three, then we need to exercise it. So if you believe it, you will exercise it. Luke 10, 17, it says, the 72 returned with joy. So some people, you know, in our day and age will say, oh, no, only, only the 12 disciples were given power over the demons. Well, here's the problem. Um, we see in Luke that 72 people were given authority. And the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Um, so the Lord gave them power and authority to deal with demonic spirits. We see in the New Testament... Philip, who went to Samaria, cast out demons. He wasn't one of the 12. We see that Barnabas, um, who was with Paul, his companion, was not one of the 12. He had authority to cast out demons. And so in understanding the authority that God has given us, we actually have power and authority, and we have to believe it. And in dealing with this idea of casting out demons, violent resistance is 
actually what the word entails. In the Greek, all contexts of the word cast out deal with some level of degree or violence in dealing with demons. Only a couple instances in a couple of the letters of Paul does the same word cast out have to deal with maybe pushing something away. But in terms of dealing with demonic spirits, it's always the same word used in dealing with violence to some degree. So that means that God is calling us to push away that which is not of him, to, to not just be willing to live with it, but to discern it and then push it away. And we have this promise in 1 John 4.4. 4. It says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them for he who is in the world, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So the promise is this, that if we will do what God has called us to do, if we will discern the voices that are approaching us and know when it's a demonic spirit and cast it away, cast it off, that we can actually overcome and be victorious. So let's pray. God, we thank you for this time. God, we thank you for your power and your authority at work in our lives. Lord, we are praying that you would come. And God, we're praying that your Holy Spirit would just pour out on us right now. God, I pray that you would help each person to discern God, different things that are in their life and different voices that are clearly demonic voices, that are clearly voices of the enemy. God, we pray that you would cause everybody to discern right now, to hear, to know, and to do something about it. God, we don't want to give place to lies. We don't want to give place to demonic reasoning or doctrines of demons in our thought life. God, we offer our lives up to you and we pray that you would search us, know us, clean us, purify us. God, any way that we give place to demonic lies in our mind and in our thinking, we repent. God, we repent and we pray that you would help us for that repentance to be perpetual and persistent and um, to, to be completed in you. Lord, we, we offer this afternoon and the prayer time that we're about to have up to you. And we pray that you would come with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. So who has prayer needs? prayer needs and it what's your prayer need